Welcome back. Been a slow couple of days in news, hasn't it? Not a whole lot to talk about. Actually, completely the opposite. Crazy, crazy news across all of motorsport has been dumping all over the place in the last couple of days, and we're going to talk about it all here today on this video. Of course, the two major stories. Number one, Jimmy Johnson announced today that he will be racing for two years, sponsorship pending, with Chip Ganassi Racing in IndyCar on the road and street circuits. There's a ton to talk about there, a ton to break down, and possibilities of where that's going to go. We also need to talk about the California Speedway, Fontana Raceway, or Auto Club if you're a Zoomer. Raceway getting bulldozed. They're going to go get the dozer. They're going to knock down the two-mile track and put up a half-mile short track. As if you couldn't think that 2020 would get any more weird, that's the stuff we're talking about today. But there's other things as well, and let's get into it right now. It's hard to call it this week in racing because pretty much every week in racing has been either no news or news of just races getting shut down, and who wants to talk about that? So let's call this... Uh, the first this month and a half in racing? Let's get going. So, a story that obviously affects this channel and myself personally very closely. Braden Eves, as you may well be aware, uh, suffered this absolutely horrendous crash at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway about a week ago when the rear wheel of his car left it, came underneath it, and launched him skyward where he impacted the ground and Unfortunately, the roll bar actually came off of the car as it slid on the ground, uh, causing some injuries to Braden, including uh, two compression fractures in his neck and a fracture above his eye. And of course, we were all very worried about him uh, initially, but as he does, Braden is, uh, is a fighter, no doubt about it. And he was out of the hospital within, I think, 48 hours, and, and the first day out of the hospital, the first place he went was Newcastle Motorsports Park, a racetrack to go support our buddy Jacob Abel, who was racing uh, for Will Power Cart that weekend. And I can tell you this, uh, Braden is extremely motivated, extremely excited to get back to racing. He won't be racing the rest of the year. Obviously, those injuries are going to take a while uh, to heal. However, he's, he's absolutely going to be making a comeback, and I think many of you, uh, myself included, were all very excited uh, to see him in his comeback year because he is going to be motivated. Formula One news, Sergio Perez announced on Twitter today that he is leaving Racing Point at the end of the 2020 season. Now, there's questions of where Sergio Perez's uh, future may lie. There's could he be in F1? Is there a seat for him in F1? Unlikely. So then you start thinking, well, does the World Endurance Championship make sense? Does IndyCar make sense? What about Formula E? There's places where a soon out of work Formula One driver can go. and We'll be obviously monitoring that as it goes on. But the, the media's focus really has been on Sebastian Vettel and his expected announcement at that seat after his unceremonious dropping at Ferrari. And, of course, that team is going to be rebranded as Aston Martin next year. Racing Point seems on the up and up. Obviously, they, they copied the Mercedes car to, quite frankly, great effect at this point. They seem like they're a very competitive team. And will Sebastian Vettel raise that profile? We'll just have to wait and see. LMP3 will join IMSA's top category, the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, starting next year. They will compete in seven separate events, bringing the class count at some races to five. LMP2 will return as well, in addition to LMP3 and DPI, giving the IMSA Series three total prototype classes. P2 will be running at only six events next year. And this is, of course, all contingent on the 2021 schedule that IMSA released today. And the reason I'm not going to give that very much time of day is because, and it's nothing against IMSA, but ultimately, looking at schedules, we know what has happened to so many racing schedules this year. Um, and with the amount of uncertainty in the world, it's hard to predict where and when people will be racing next year. Now, LMP3, it's an interesting category. At least it seems to promise that there will be more than one chassis manufacturer starting the season next year. So that is an improvement over LMP2. However, it has to be said that three different prototype categories almost seems like overkill for IMSA. But with, uh, unfortunately, uh, lackluster car counts as 
not only does the economic uh, slow down hurt IMSA, but certainly other manufacturers like Porsche pulling out at the end of this year uh, certainly hurts IMSA. They're going to need to boost the car count, and LMP3 seems to be the way they're deciding to do that. Now we move on to one of the big stories, Jimmy Johnson. It's a little bit expected at this point, no doubt about it. Jimmy was making a lot of noise about this. He was obviously taking it very seriously. But today we got the announcement of where he plans to race Indy cars in 2021 and 2022. And it's with Chip Ganassi Racing. A two-year deal right now is in the works to run all road and street courses in the next two years with Chip Ganassi Racing. Now, there is no sponsorship as of right now. That's something we're going to talk about in uh, just a bit because that's a very key point to this and it's amazing because of the announcement video it's not even something that's been filmed recently it was something that was filmed way back at the end of July beginning of August when Jimmy did his IndyCar test he pretty much he, he literally filmed his announcement video that he was running IndyCar with Ganassi at that test so that should tell you a little bit some something about how well that test went of course, I was one of the only people there who actually saw it with my own two eyes. I covered it on the channel. So if you want to see some of the footage and some of my immediate reactions just after that, check out the channel, subscribe, because, you know, God willing, I'll be doing more of that stuff in the coming months and the coming years. Now, Jimmy Johnson in IndyCar racing. It's, it's, it's not as unexpected as maybe it would have been about a year ago. Uh, I guess the... the surprise for some probably is that it that it came with Ganassi despite the fact that he tested originally he was going to run a couple of races this year it seemed like uh, with McLaren uh, he was at least going to get a test of Barber Motorsports Park that unfortunately all fell apart because of you know what and Jimmy then you know didn't give up he showed up in a Ganassi car at Indianapolis Motor Speedway and at least to my eye, again, you know, I, you can take or leave what I, what my opinion of, of, of how a race car driver looks on track is. If you hadn't told me Jimmy Johnson was in that car at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, if it had just been Felix Rosenquist or Scott Dixon or Marcus Erickson, you would have told me they were testing that car. I would have believed you. And that is to say that Jimmy Johnson looked extremely comfortable in that car. Uh, he looked like a race veteran. He looked like somebody... Who could get the job done and based on his lap times remember this was the first time he'd ever been in an Indy car he only had uh, Firestone black tires didn't have access to the reds it was a hot day uh, from what I remember it was a uh, really really blazing I think it was close to 100 degrees very very hot and these are not ideal conditions uh, and certainly when you consider that usually the Grand Prix of Indianapolis happens in, happens in fairly cool conditions in May uh, the, the comparable lap times for Jimmy were, were really, really good. Now, like I said, doesn't have any sponsorship as of right now. And there's a couple of things that I want to talk about there because it's very interesting. It seems like this, if it happens, I assume it will happen. Um, I'm betting on it if they had got out there and announced it this early. It's going to be a fourth team. I don't expect that Marcus Erickson or Felix Rosenquist and certainly not Scott Dixon are going to get bumped from the team for this. So that leads to a very interesting conundrum. You're essentially going to have a car that has sponsorship for most of the races, but not all of them. The only places that they're not going to be having sponsorship for as of right now would be Gateway, Texas, Iowa, and Indy. The 500. And <laughs> there, there's a couple of possibilities. The first thing I want to say is that it's if they had had a sponsor ready to go, they probably would have announced that today. So this announcement today, in my opinion, is sponsorship bait. They are going to try to entice partners to come on and help fund this program. Remember, Chip never does anything for free or at a cost to him. So that's not going to be happening. So they're going to need money. My opinion, and again, I've been wrong before. My opinion is it's going to be, even with Jimmy Johnson, a tough sell to sell a sponsorship for only the road and street races. Now, 
do I think it's impossible? No. And there's a very real possibility that it could happen. My opinion is, again, totally could be wrong here. My opinion is that a sponsor, if they get a sponsor, or if it takes a while to get a sponsor, they are going to have to throw the Indy 500 into that pot. Probably with Jimmy Johnson racing. Again, this is my opinion. Uh, it's mainly based on the fact that Jimmy himself has said that he's open to the possibility. He seems extremely gung ho on racing Indy cars. I mean, you could clearly the man got out of the Indy car that he had just tested for one day and said, "This has lit a competitive fire under me. Uh, I'm signing with Ganassi. We're going to race the next two years." Uh, he's talked about oval racing before. And you may be asking, well, why wouldn't they just announce that he's running the Indy 500 today? Well, it's a negotiation tactic, in my opinion. It's something that Ganassi and Jimmy could keep in the back pocket. If it's, you know, I think his best case scenario is he probably just wants to run the road and street circuits, at least for the first year. If he absolutely has to, I'm sure he could probably be convinced to run the Indy 500. We'll have to see. Now, let's just talk about the road and street circuits for Jimmy Johnson, because that is extremely interesting and I think it shows the right way for someone as an outsider to join an open wheel category an IndyCar category in particular and I'm going to make the comparison Fernando Alonso this is a comp direct comparison with Fernando Alonso here Alonso came in for just one race uh, once every couple of years depending on his Formula One contracts raced and then jetted back to Europe. Jimmy Johnson is committing to virtually an entire season of preparation with one of the best teams in the paddock. And I think that is going to pay dividends long term. Jimmy may not be competitive right out of the gate, but I guarantee you by the end of 2022, he will not only be racing competitively, he'll probably be racing for wins. Because of the simple fact that seat time is extremely important in not only racing, but particularly in IndyCar racing. And particularly for a driver like Jimmy Johnson, who doesn't have a ton of open wheel experience. This is going to be completely new to him. Now that being said, this is going to be an extremely exciting story to follow. This is going to inject some life into an IndyCar season, which maybe he hasn't had a whole lot of life outside of the Indianapolis 500 for quite a, t a time. There's going to be a lot of NASCAR fans excited to see that first race that Jimmy Johnson is in. Will it be a TV ratings absolute boom? I have no idea. But I think those ratings are going to be very high for, again, God willing, St. Pete in March uh, to see how Jimmy Johnson does. There's going to be a ton of interest. And if you don't think he's going to be successful or can be successful, I'd just really like to point out to you the type of drivers who are successful in IndyCar racing right now. They're older guys. Takuma Sato, in his 40s, just won his second Indy 500. Doesn't look like he's showing any signs of slowing down. Scott Dixon just got his record or, uh, his 50th win. He's breathing down the neck of Mario Andretti and almost certainly will pass him this year. Probably going to pass A.J. Foyt before the end of his career. Again, another driver doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Emerson Fittipaldi had a very, very successful championship winning uh, you know, F1 career, took even a couple of years off in the 80s, came to IndyCar racing, and then had a whole second career which involved championships and Indy 500 wins. There's a distinct possibility that Jimmy Johnson could have a total career resurgence in IndyCar racing. Don't believe me? Well, we'll come back to this video in two years, I guess, and determine whether or not uh, Jimmy's IndyCar adventure is a success. That being said... It's going to be an exciting moment for the sport. It's going to be exciting to see what happens. I cannot wait to see what happens. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments. And finally, this probably couldn't get any more 2020 if it tried, but the Auto Club Speedway is getting the dozer reported initially in The Athletic. The two-mile track is going to be demolished and rebuilt uh, following the 2021 race at the track for a half mile short track. Yes, I, I can't believe that this is true, but it is true. So here's my initial thought. 
Uh, I'm honestly disappointed. Fontana Auto Club, California, however you want to call the track, is one of six super speedways in the country right now. And really, if you look at the world, and when I say super speedway, I mean two-mile oval plus. 200-mile-an-hour speeds, more than possible. I mean, Auto Club Speedway is the fastest racetrack in the world, 241 miles an hour uh, by Jill LeFerrin in 2000. So the fact that as a country, really as a world, We're down to Daytona, Talladega, Pocono, Michigan, and Indianapolis in terms of 200-mile-an-hour super speedways that are open to the public. It's disappointing. There's no doubt about it. Um, And to me, you know, there are some people who say, well, it's just a clone of Michigan. Kind of? I mean, show me a race at Fontana that really raced the same way as, as Michigan. And I think a lot of people would say that Fontana really produces a better product than Michigan. I mean, it was built by Roger Penske. They're coming for me. Uh, it was built by Roger Penske as uh, a, an opportunity uh, to improve on Michigan because that was already a track he owned, uh, both figuratively and literally. Uh, I mean, his his uh, drivers were always very good there. They always did a lot of testing there. Um, but to me, you know, if you if you made me pick, you know, which track I was gonna you know watch a race on TV at. It was probably going to be Fontana. It's disappointing. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and I think a lot of people say, well, well, why didn't they just do this to Texas? Or why didn't they do this to Kentucky? Or one of the other one and a half mile tracks that are kind of boring. Well, the reason that they didn't is because NASCAR doesn't own them. It's an SMI versus ISC slash NASCAR. Of course, now it's just NASCAR thing. NASCAR has a certain amount of tracks that they own. And ultimately... There were choices that had to be made. I mean, I think there was a possibility that this could have happened to Chicagoland. Uh, Because remember, I mean, it seems like ages ago now, but there was a lot of talk that NASCAR was considering selling off land at that track. Well, it seems like it's going to happen here at Auto Club Speedway. It seems like they're, you know, California property values, they're pretty high. Uh, I don't know how high they're going to be after this year. Maybe NASCAR is selling exactly at the right time. Maybe they're not. But uh, I would imagine that a lot of that land is going to get sold. Uh, NASCAR will make a pretty penny from it, and then they'll have they'll still have a track in the Los Angeles area. Just they'll have less property taxes and whatnot to pay on it, which in some ways will be a good thing for NASCAR. And I think more to the point, talking about that Los Angeles market, I think it's obvious, isn't it? The 2022 season is going to end at the new Auto Club Speedway, right? It's just too perfect. Just look no further than the celebrities being used to explain the playoffs. Uh, NASCAR has always had kind of this obsession with with the Hollywood culture ever since their boom. And it makes a ton of sense that the final race would be within striking distance of Hollywood. Not a long drive for some big stars to show up and make a big fuss and, and, you know, wave and, and get a lot of people out there. But at the same time, they did make a move for the fans here. Because, while I won't say it would have been easy just to move the finale to Fontana, would the finale at Fontana have been any good, been any, been any exciting? Probably not, especially with the current power, or with the current package, current horsepower, all that stuff. A short track will at least appease the fans for in the short term. And, honestly, they've already kind of ripped that band-aid off by going to Phoenix. They moved the finale out of the south, which... You know, obviously, some people don't consider Florida the South, but it pretty much is the South. It's within striking distance of that, you know, mecca of NASCAR. Moving it to Phoenix, you've ripped that Band-Aid off and said, oh, okay, the championship is now happening at Phoenix. Well, it doesn't look like Phoenix is going to be a particularly popular championship track. Moving it to a half-mile short track, suddenly the fans are going to be a lot more on your side. So... Really, from a NASCAR perspective, this makes a, a just so much sense. It's a track you own. It's a track you can do whatever you want with. It's a track with high property value, so you can sell the parts of land that you no longer need. You can add a short track to the schedule without having to cut one of your own tracks. You can put it in the Los Angeles market, which means that you can ha- finish your season there. You can have a big, ginormous party with all sorts of celebrities and have that big 
big game feel that maybe you want for your championship race, it makes way too much sense from NASCAR perspective. From a historical perspective, from a competition perspective, from, you know, especially the historical perspective, it's disappointing. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, it, it's shades of Ontario Motor Speedway. It's shades of Riverside. Just in this case, we're not totally losing the track. It's just being converted uh, to a to a half mile short track. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We'll have to wait and see. I think for, from a NASCAR perspective, it's a good thing. They will benefit from this. From the perspective of having a unique super speedway in the United States, that's disappointing. Um, there are short tracks that NASCAR could have added to the schedule and kept Fontana as a two-mile track. But it is what it is. So thank you guys so much for watching. What did you think of this video? What did you think of the stuff in it? What did you think of the stuff I talked about? Let me know down in the comments section below. Get well, Beavs, and we'll see you in the next video.